Hello, and welcome to the Medical Sales Podcast, and I am your host, Samuel. In this podcast, I interview top medical sales reps and leading medical sales executives across the entire country. And it doesn't matter what medical sales industry, from medical device to pharmaceutical to genetic testing to diagnostic lab, you name it, you will learn how to either break into the industry, be a top 5% performer within your role in sales, or climb the corporate ladder. Welcome to the Medical Sales Podcast. Hello and welcome to the Medical Sales Podcast. I'm your host, Samuel. And today we have with us another special guest, and he goes by the name of David Howe. He is the Vice President of Sales at Oso VR, a company that specializes in virtual reality surgical training for surgeons and medical sales reps. If you've ever wondered how virtual reality fits in the medical sales space, this is the episode you absolutely want to listen to. As always, we do our best to bring you guests that are doing things differently and doing amazing things, innovative things in the medical sales space. And I really do hope you enjoy this interview. Hey, Dave, how are we doing today? Hey, Samuel, doing great. How about yourself? Fantastic. No complaints. Why don't you tell the audience who you are and what you do? Yeah, absolutely. And before I do, just thank you so much for having me. I love talking about medical device and software and sales and business. So I'm really excited about the conversation today and appreciate you having me on the show. Uh, But who is Dave Howe? Um, Tell you some kind of high level background about myself. Uh, I'm from upstate New York originally. I went to college in upstate New York. I eventually moved to Washington, DC. I lived there for 12 years and then Uh, Most recently, I'm a newly minted Texan, so I moved to Austin, Texas about two years ago and living in a new city, a new state, a new part of the country, and so it's a really exciting time and I'm really happy with where I landed here. Um, In terms of who I am professionally, I'm currently the Vice President of Sales at Oso VR, so I have a few responsibilities at Oso. Uh, I oversee our net new business team, so this is the team that's sort of responsible for landing contracts with new customers. So like the pre-sales team, and then also the post-sales team on account management, which is the team responsible for uh, expanding those relationships and growing the relationships, as well as our sales operations and uh, sales development teams. So I've been here for about four years now. Um, I started as the 12th employee. We're currently over 200. So it's been a really fun and fast growing journey. Yeah, it's been really wild for us, but Um, I think also maybe my background might be helpful and sort of how I landed where I am. So I started my career. Before you jump into that, tell us, you know, a lot of people listening right now, they might be in the car. They might have, might not have the ability to look up. Well, what does Oso VR do? Tell us what Oso VR does. Oh God. Well, this will be a huge detour. Um, (laughs) So what is Oso VR? We are a virtual reality surgical training and assessment platform. So uh, I guess I would describe it first by kind of beginning with the problems that we're trying to solve and kind of where we are and how we got here. So I like to describe this in terms of the current state of medical education and medical device sales training. And I think the best way to think about this, um, you know, I was originally a medical device. I left in 2010 and I went into software and technology and I came back eight years later at Oso. And during that time that I left the industry to when I came back, I was blown away by the innovation that's taken place from a yeah, sort of product, medical device technology, surgical technique standpoint. So it's robotics and navigation and software assisted surgery and AI and patient specific implants. And so there's just mountains and mountains of data points and clinical studies and validation that's been done to show that these product and techniques have really significant outcomes, uh, significant impact on patient outcomes. Um, But there's also a similar amount of data that shows that the learning curve associated with these techniques is similarly really high and difficult to overcome. And so the challenge is that we haven't really innovated in medical education in the same way that we have from a technology and techniques. So we're still training surgeons the same way that we train them one, two, three decades ago. And this is primarily sort of two buckets. You have passive learning, which is like techniques, videos, animations, webinars, 
Um, but the problem is with these sort of approaches is that skill transfer doesn't really take place, right? These are technical skills you have to learn by getting hands on practice. Right. Um, and so the majority of skill transfer takes place in that sort of hands on setting. And so for today and the way we've done it historically, this is mostly old school simulators, bone models, cadavers. And these are really challenging in large part because you typically have to have a trainee travel to the lab or bring the lab to the trainee. This is really expensive to deliver. And because it's ex expensive, there's sort of short periods of training um, offered for the trainee. And so you're trying to cram all the training and education into one session and not really incorporating adult learning concepts like spaced repetition. Um, there's minimal assessment that takes place with these types of hands-on training. And mm -hmm. uh, they also simulate a limited number of procedures. So sort of challenges are there's too much to learn. Uh, there's not enough time to learn it. There is limited assessment. Um, in the case of medical device sales reps, there is limited support, right? Like reps are expected to do more today with less support from the company. Absolutely. And then it's expensive and inefficient. Yeah. So with OSO VR, what we do is we provide virtual reality surgical training and assessment. And in that sort of VR environment, what you have is an interactive and immersive 3D technology that allows the trainee to incorporate adult learning concepts like spaced repetition. So because this is really a $300 headset that you could buy off of Amazon or Best mm -hmm. Buy and you right. know, less than five pounds fits in a shoebox, you can ship it out and keep it with people and they can practice 20, 30 minutes at a time, space out their training over several days or weeks. Um, it allows for objective assessment. We can si simulate an unlimited number of procedures. Um, and so it's really just sort of bringing medical education and medical device sales training up to speed with the needs for today's medical device technologies and techniques. So you guys go to medical technology companies and offer these services for them to then, I guess, sell to their customers. Yeah, exactly. They don't sell it. They provide it as sort of a component of the surgeon training journey. So yeah, we work primarily with medical device companies like Johnson and Johnson, Stryker, Zimmer Biomet, Smith and Nephew, Medtronic. Okay. And what we do is we build out their products and their surgical techniques in our virtual environment. And then they have a fleet of their own headsets that they deploy in the field, primarily for surgeon training and medical education. Uh, medical sales training, as well as um, medical device sales rep enablement. So it's a great tool for reps to have in the field to sort of provide on-demand product demos and right. put a surgeon uh, or you know procedural physician into a 3D environment to allow them to experience the technology um, in the moment where they're expressing interest. How long has this been, you know, how new is this space? Has it been around for quite a while? and and it's just growing so much more right now is it relatively brand new i mean talk to us a little bit about about that yeah it's a great question so the idea of virtual reality as a concept has actually been around for decades uh, but more recently uh in around like 2014 2015 oculus launched a kickstarter campaign and created the first sort of mass market VR headset. And they were eventually acquired by Facebook, now known as Meta. And Meta's put major investments into virtual reality technology to kind of grow and deploy this uh, sort of product all around the globe. And Oso was founded in 2016. I think we landed our first customer in around 2018. And today in 2022, we're training around four to 5,000 uh, surgeons as well as uh, nice. medical sales trainees every month. Nice. Four to 5,000. Wow. Did you guys experience more growth as an organization during COVID? Mm -hmm. Yeah, actually, it was a really scary time for us, uh, as it was for everyone. Uh, the state of the world was really difficult and the economy was uncertain. And I think we had sort of two theories on what would happen. Uh, on the one hand, we knew that our customers were really going to struggle and that it was going to be a really difficult time for them. Uh, at the time, we were very focused on orthopedics, which primarily consists of elective procedures, right? So no one like has to get a joint replacement procedure done. It's not like right. cardiovascular right. where, you know, if you have to have a stent, you have to have a stent. So as hospitals filled up with COVID patients, elective procedures disappeared. 
And so our customers' businesses were really impacted. And we knew that was going to happen really from the moment everything started shutting down. However, simultaneously, uh, what this provided in terms of an opportunity for us is the reality that people no longer wanted to get together in person. And so it forced the medical device companies to rethink how they were providing training and education for their customers and for their employees. And one of the killer features of virtual reality and also VR is the ability to provide what we call collaborative training experiences. So Samuel, if I sent you a headset with our technology on it and you're in California, Mm -hmm. West coast, yeah. So you could put that headset on and I could put my headset on here in Austin and we could meet in a virtual operating room and we could train together. And so sort of like need that was created as a result of COVID was a perfect setting for Oso to grow. And so at the time, I think, you know, we were really concerned because anytime your customers are negatively impacted, there's often a downstream impact on your business. And we certainly felt that to an extent. But the interest and awareness and sort of like inbound inquiries relating to Oso VR just went through the roof. And so it, it ended up being a real accelerant for our company and wow. technology. Yeah. 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 It makes yeah. sense. You know, a lot of virtual companies experience that. So after COVID, people are now, you know, in some cases looking forward to getting back to meeting in person. How, how is VR? I mean, how is Oso VR adjusting to all of this? Yeah. And you can't replace an in-person experience, right? There is something to being with people in the real world and being face to face that you really just can't simulate at least today with any type of technology, whether it's a zoom session or with a collaborative training session like the Oso VR. What I would say is that we really aren't looking to replace all of the traditional modalities of surgical training. We're really looking to sort of augment and enhance the sort of overall pathway. And so a lot of the issues with uh, the in-person training, they're, they're kind of a few fold. One is that it's hard to assess when a trainee is ready for that next step, right? So people are coming back together and they're meeting in person. And there are certain aspects of the in-person experience that virtual reality like does not really provide. But how do you know that they have enough of a baseline sort of background on the technique to take the most advantage of that in-person experience? So having that hands-on experience, having those spaced repetition, having that assessment allows us to confirm a trainee's preparedness so that when we invest all that time and money to bring them in person, we're delivering the experience and the confidence that we need to deliver to hopefully have that individual be next step, which is ideally taking that product and technique into an operating room or working with a patient without having to come for several in-person sessions because they didn't get it the first time. So it doesn't really do much in terms of, um, you know, any sort of negative impact on Oso. I I think if anything, we just are becoming more integrated into that traditional pathway that we've seen historically. Got it. So, you know, of course you guys see every advantage with this model and why it can just be better for a better experience for the surgeons than in person. What are the surgeons saying after that are used to the old model after the experience Oso VR, uh, what are they saying to their customers that you guys get to hear? They're really excited about it. I think that a lot of surgeons have felt really frustrated for a long time with the lack of opportunity to adopt these technologies that they want to use because it helps their patients and differentiates their practice. And so to see a technology company like Oso VR provide these types of experience, I think for most surgeons, is really refreshing. I think that for the residents, fellows, early career surgeons, this is the type of training and education that they're expecting today. Mm -hmm. This is sort of like, we're just delivering on expectations, right? They are not expecting that they have to go travel, you know, for a three days for a half day course. Mm -hmm. They're expecting you to bring the training to them in a digital and efficient manner. What's really remarkable though, is the more mature and more experienced surgeons and how do they react to it? And the feedback from them is consistently positive as well. The technology is really easy and simple to use. They've been around, they've seen it all. 
uh, but they've never seen anything quite like this. And so um, really kind of across the board, there is a lot of excitement around what we're doing at Oso. That is amazing. So the application that you guys currently focus on right now is training, getting yeah. these providers yeah, trained to do these procedures that they're relatively unfamiliar with or that's just completely new to them. Is there an application with using something like Oso VR in a, in a live case? Oh, are there future, mm. are there intentions to take it to actual yeah. cases? Yeah. So that's a great question. And I, I think the future of technology and healthcare is really exciting um, and really exciting also within this sort of extended reality, virtual reality, augmented reality category. I think that virtual reality um, and again, to describe what virtual reality is, it's putting a headset on and really finding yourself in a completely virtual world where you don't see anything of the real world around you. So virtual reality is really best suited for surgical training. And I don't really see any opportunity or moment where VR is going to be used in an operating room or a case, but I for sure see that coming right around the corner with augmented reality. So the difference with augmented reality is augmented reality is essentially, I would describe it as placing a digital layer over the real world. The best example of this, it's kind of comical, is probably Pokemon Go, where you could hold your phone up and see Pokemons as you're yeah. walking on the street, right? And so um, there are companies and technologies out there that are pursuing this, where you could put a product on like Microsoft HoloLens, and you could have direction and intraoperative kind of guidance on a surgical technique uh, while in the operating room. And there are different flavors of this. There are companies pursuing it with the sort of uh, glasses perspective, like Microsoft HoloLens. There are other companies like Proxmi and Avail that are doing this kind of remote telementoring that are providing intraoperative support using augmented reality. So I for sure see a lot of innovation coming intraoperatively. Um, the sort of context for why it's lagging is the technology from the augmented reality category isn't as mature or advanced as virtual reality today. So they're still really developing that, but it's right around the corner. And I think it's going to be huge in surgery and it's going to be huge in our day to day lives. Got it. Are there any other applications you guys are considering outside of training surgeons? No, I mean, it really, I mean, there's the three categories, right? It's training surgeons, uh, training medical device sales reps, and then sales enablement for medical device reps. So like product demos, product awareness, and so forth. And I think those are really the key categories. I think that we continue to invest in the product and technology uh, via enhancing different platform features like collaborative training, assessment, and analytics. Um as well as sort of the user experience and user interface and different ways that we can deliver the technology more at scale um, and with less friction. And so I think for the foreseeable future, we'll stay really focused on those categories and just continue to enhance the sort of existing product that we have. Got it. And do, do individual sales reps, is there any out, is there any opportunity for them to, learn about the Oso VR technology and what it does for their surgeons, or is, are you guys exclusively working with established organizations? And that's pretty much the only way a sales rep can know more about Oso VR. Yeah, unfortunately, um, aside from, you know, Googling Oso, checking out our website, our podcast, sure. our YouTube channel, really has to go through one of our existing customers or through finding us at a conference or trade show and trying the technology there. Um, we do hope to, in the future, find ways to provide the technology more like kind of direct to consumer, if you will. Um, but for the time, it's sort of B2B to C, right? We're providing the technology, our business to the medical device companies, and then they're providing the technology to their customers, their consumers. Um, but hopefully we can change that in the future. Absolutely. Now, is this space, do you guys as an organization, do you guys have a sales team, right? You guys, of course, have a yeah. sales team. Um, yeah. Were they, do they come from medical sales? Uh, do you, and you know, if, if, uh, if someone's listening to this right now and thinking, wow, it'd be so cool to work for a company like this, you know, what, what is the opportunity there for someone to work yeah. with as a sales rep for Osovir? 
It's the million dollar question you asked. Um, it's something that I've had to think a lot about over the years. And I think the way I would describe this, it was like really a huge challenge for us from a sales standpoint, because there are sort of two components of being really successful at sales at Oso. Um, one is to your point, having some sort of clinical or surgical background, being comfortable with the vernacular within surgery, medical device, being in an operating room, understanding the way that these large Fortune 1000 organizations operate and do business. And it's really very much almost borderline a technical skill that you need like a technical sale, like you almost you need to be like an engineer, sort of like the, the experience and training you get in medical device is really unique, right? When I went into software and worked for my first tech company, I sold public relations software to businesses. And I always joke that like, I could sell that just using plain English. You can't really do that at Oso. You need to know the industry, the background, surgical techniques, the trends. You have to have that for credibility. And then on the other hand, uh, from a B2B SaaS and tech sales perspective, we're selling primarily to large medical device companies. And it is an investment. It's not a cheap product. And so the sales process is pretty nuanced and involves a lot of different stakeholders. And it's really a true enterprise B2B SaaS motion, uh, which is something that is unique and difficult to teach and get someone up to speed quickly. And so the question was, because interestingly, there aren't many people that have done medical device sales and done B2B SaaS. And so the question was, which is more important in which direction do we go? And the conclusion that I came to is that I wanted to build a team with both types of expertise and build a really strong culture that includes a lot of collaboration and teamwork and camaraderie so that these individuals will work together, help one another, teach one another, and through kind of our shared knowledge, work together to be successful as a sales organization. So today we have people on the team that have never sold B2B SaaS and their career came directly from medical device and working for Oso VR today. And we have people on the team that have never sold medical device and have only sold B2B SaaS. So we have, we have both types on the team and certainly still looking at and recruiting from uh, the medical device industry as well as B2B SaaS. Got it. And who performs better? <laughs> uh, well, you know, what I like to say is um, whoever works the hardest is the most likely to succeed. Um, sure, and that sure. still rings true at Oso. Sure, sure. I'm, I'm joking with you. Okay, so <laughs> so let, let's walk back now to understand a little bit about, about your history. So take us back to college. Yeah. You know, was it, oh. you know, one day I'm going to be working at a company that that's going to revolutionize training for surgeons or, or, or were you going a completely different direction? You know, it's such a funny story and such a winding journey. And I listened to a few other episodes of your podcast before we spoke today. And it's interesting how many other folks have like a similar, you know, I was over here and then over there and then over here. And then all of a sudden it all came together and I never could have seen how it would happen. And that's true for me as well. And so my, uh, initial focus was I wanted to be a physician and I was pre-med undergrad. I landed this really competitive scholarship at the National Cancer Institute out of school. And I was super excited about it. But when I got into the experience, I wasn't super engaged. I didn't love it. And I spent a lot of time trying to think about why I wasn't as engaged as I was in the classroom. And I started to realize that I loved education. I loved learning. I was getting that in the lab, but there was an aspect of being in the classroom where the idea that my performance could be quantified and compared against my peers, I found to be really engaging. And I think there's like a little bit of a competitive streak in me and a lot of us in sales. And so I started thinking about this and looking into what different types of career paths are out there. And I learned about sales and it interested me from that perspective, as far as the sort of competitive nature, the sort of quantifiable reality of your performance, as well as other aspects of uh, career in sales. And so I started to think that it might be something that I would be interested in. And 
I, I went to the um, chief of our branch at the National Cancer Institute. His name is Dr. Grass at the Experimental Transplantation and Immunology Branch of the National Cancer Institute. And mm-hmm. I remember really sheepishly explaining to him that I was doubting a career in medicine, which was uh, a little bit terrifying for me, knowing that he was an MD, PhD. Most right. of our mentors were MD, PhDs. All my peers right. minimally have their MD today, as well as an MPH, PhD, so forth. And he gave me this amazing advice, which was, you know, when you're 23, you mm-hmm. think that you have an eternity to do all the things you want to do in your career. And in reality, Facts. you don't. Right. Facts. And right. so if you're doubting that you want to be a physician at 23, I can tell you for sure when you're in year three of medical school, you are going to know that you don't want to be a physician. And he said, my advice to you would be you follow your passion and go do what you think you want to do and try to make that work and spend your 20s figuring it out, figuring it out in terms of exactly where you want to be. So I took his advice to heart. I went out and looked for how can I get into sales? What does a career in sales look like? But I was still a little afraid of like closing the door on medical school. And that's where I learned about med device sales. And so I thought this is a perfect opportunity. I could try sales and also strengthen my resume if I did ultimately want to go to medical school. The problem was I didn't know how to sell anything. Um, So it was really challenging getting an opportunity in med device. I think I had like hundreds of applications, maybe a handful of interviews and one offer that I took immediately. Uh, And I got into the industry. I did sales for several years. And um, I loved sales. I loved med device, but for a few different reasons, I thought I might want to continue in sales, but in a different space. And back in 2010, a company reached out to me about tech sales and B2B SaaS. At that point, tech wasn't what it is today. I really didn't know what it meant to sell software. I I thought like, what am I going to be selling like Microsoft office at Best Buy? Like, what do you mean selling software? Right. And I I went to their office. I interviewed, had a really fun culture, really fun office, very Google-ish. And Mm -hmm. I took an opportunity there and I fell in love with working in technology. They were a big publicly traded company. Um, From there, I moved to progressively smaller and earlier stage companies and then ultimately landed at Oso where I was able to combine my background in sort of clinical medicine and research as well as medical device and surgery as well as technology and B2B SaaS um, and lead the sales organization at Oso. Wow. Wow. So it really was all these, these colorful experiences kind of came together to give you the opportunity to be where you are today. That is fantastic. Okay, give us a little bit about the, uh, the home dynamic, and then we're gonna wrap this up by jumping into the lightning round. So tell us, you know, how are you able to make all this happen and spend so much time growing Oso VR? Uh, family, kids, what, what, what makes it all work? <laughs> Well, that's the trick. I have no family, uh, no, no wife, no kids, no girlfriend. Um, so I am staying very focused on Oso and, you know, my relationship with my immediately, my immediate family, uh, mm-hmm. my friends traveling, just trying to live a balanced life. You know, I have hobbies like I've gotten into rock climbing recently. Um, nice. I love playing golf. I love nice. to travel. I'm a big foodie. Um, have a lot of close friendships. And so, yeah, Oso is a big part of my life. I'm fortunate that I'm really passionate about what I'm able to do with the company, the people that I work with, what we're providing for the world. And I do spend a lot of time working, but a pretty balanced life as well, just not with a wife and kids. All right. Then if there's one message you can give our audience, and remember, we have people that are trying to get into medical sales, uh, any any kind of medical sales, so pharmaceutical, medical device, uh, biotech, dental. We have people that are in medical sales and we have people that are leading the way. What What piece of advice would you leave them? I think for me, it's find great mentors and be a great mentee. I think that for me, the people that I have connected with, that I have stayed in touch with, that I've been able to call up when I have difficult situations and questions, that I haven't encountered or challenges that I'm trying to overcome. I think the tailored advice that comes from someone with experience is invaluable. And you can 
You can read a lot. You should read a lot. You can listen to podcasts. You should listen to podcasts. You can, you can work hard and invest in yourself and you should do all of that as well. But for me, if I didn't have great mentors and great relationships with people that have done it before, there's no way I would be where I am today. Wow. Spoken like someone that uh, that's really been blessed with great people to lead the way. So that's, that's great. Thank you for that. Okay. Are you ready for the lightning round? I am ready for the lightning round. Okay. First question. Uh, best book you've read in the last six months? So best book in the last six months is Snowflake uh, by Frank Slootman. He's the CEO of Snowflake, which is a big B2B SaaS company. Uh, it's a mm -hmm. great read for anybody looking to understand B2B SaaS. Very nice. Best movie in the last six months? Okay. So I'm not huge into movies and there's only show. one movie I've seen. <laughs> well, I'll go with movies because I, I did love Top Gun. Uh, it's And it's actually not even like, you know, in terms of it being like a blockbuster hit, not even really the type of genre I'd normally get into as far as a film. But I mean, I loved the original Top Gun and I saw the more recent one in theaters and I hadn't been to a theater in like three years. So sure. for sure it'd be Top Gun. Man, you're like the third or fourth person that's told me this movie is a, I've never seen it, but it's a must see. So I'm going to have to make it happen. All yeah. right. Best meal in the last six months. Okay. This one I could talk about on like a whole other episode, but for me, uh, this meal at Puyo, it's a restaurant in Mexico city. It was ranked number nine on the world's top 50 restaurants wow. list. Yeah. It was really incredible. Um, they have this aged mole dish. Uh, that comes at the end of this amazing tasting menu. And this mole has been aged for nine years and it wow. is just something that's life changing. So, yeah. Oh my gosh. You that. just, you officially <laughs> sold me on that one. Mexico city. Here I come. All and right. Everybody go to Mexico city. <laughs> oh, wow. And then the last question, uh, what is the best experience you've had in the last six months? Well, aside from Puyol, um, it would probably be that Mexico City trip. So, like I said, I'm really tight with my immediate family. Sure. Uh, my brother and I do an annual brother's trip. And so our trip this year awesome. was to Mexico City. And it was my first time to CDMX. And I absolutely loved it. Encourage everybody to go there as soon as you can. That is fantastic. You know, those sibling trips are critically important. I do the same thing with my with my sisters. So that that is fantastic, Dave. Dave, we loved hearing from you today and we learned so much about Oso VR and the amazing technology in the med cell space uh, with, with what you guys are doing with surgeons. We look forward to seeing more from you and thank you for being on well, the show. Well, thank you, Samuel. Yeah, thank you for having me. And that was David Howe. Fascinating stuff. Well, if you've listened to any episodes of the Medical Sales Podcast, then you already know what I'm going to say. So I'm going to keep it very simple. If you want to get into medical sales, if you really want a position in this industry, you have to understand where you want to be and why your skills are transferable. You have to have a team and a strong network that backs you and refers you into a position. And you really got to know what you're doing as you go through the process. If you want to get a position relatively soon and not take years, then visit EvolveSuccess.com and learn about a program and that can potentially get you in position within three to four months. Thank you, as always, for listening to the Medical Sales Podcast. And make sure you tune in next week for another episode. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. And remember, I have a couple programs that show you exactly how to break into the medical sales industry, become a top-performing medical sales professional, and also how to masterfully navigate your career to executive-level leadership. Check out these programs and learn more at EvolveYourSuccess.com. Stay tuned for more awesome content with amazing interviews.